there, I'm Scotty, you're not, and welcome to a long overdue sequel -a -thon 3. That's right, 3. I should have done it last week, decided to do Smallville instead, and now I'm back, I'm doing it now, now. So we are covering, starting with, The Hangover Part 2, and uh... Yeah. What was it that Peanut said after after Jose Jalapeno after Jose Jalapeno said he was put in the vegetable steamer? Oh yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same movie. It's the same same shit. Having just watched the first one last month, right? Watching this now, it is pretty much the same things. Like I took. The script from the first film, rearranged some things, put it in Bangkok, and then boom. Same thing. Movie, you know. I don't know, I hate it as much as people do. In fact, I went to the movie theater to see this back when it came out in 2011, back when we still had a movie theater. But, uh, yeah, I can have fun with it. But it's... The first chunk of this is a little hard to get through. Once it happens where they black out again and they're starting to figure, trying to find out where Teddy is, we'll get to that, then it gets a little more fun. But it's just that the beginning of this is just so tedious in trying to recreate stuff. Like, we start off with the same scene from the last one. This time they're in Bangkok, they're on a building. Phil calls Tracy... Basic thing. Goes up to the sky. Title card. It's, you could have added a, a GTA San Andreas sound clip to that. Goes up to the sky. Oh, shit. Pff, hangover part two. Here we go again. That's what you, Oh, shit. Pff, here we go again. Just add that to it. And it absolutely summons up what happens in this film. It's the same thing, basically. All right, they try to play it up. I remember back in the theater when I first saw this, I rolled my eyes when they revealed what happened, like how they got drugged, because I want to think that this is what happened. Okay, so if you don't know about this, Stu is now getting married two years later to not Heather Graham. We'll get to that. But he's getting married. Right? They're going to Bangkok. Which is, I think, is probably the reason why there wasn't Heather Graham. Because they're just going back to Vegas. Don't want to be too similar to the first one. But, uh, and they are, he Stu is hesitant to bring Alan, but, um, Doug, Doug talks them into it, and then they, uh, are also hanging out with Lauren, his his fiance, Lauren's brother, Teddy, who's 16, by the way. And they pass out. They wake up the next day. Teddy's gone. And they have to find him. <clears throat> That's the plot point. And like I said, it starts out the same thing. One thing I'd say about the third film, as much as it's not a terrible movie, but it... it at least tries to shake things up a little bit compared to this one being just the same thing. There are various sequels that are just, oh, it's this, but now we're in there. Like Home Alone 2, oh, it's the same thing, but it's in uh, New York, right? Teen Wolf 2, oh, it's the same thing, but it's college and boxing instead of basketball. Um... It's, uh, Crocodile Dundee 2. Uh, it's the same thing, but now we're mostly in another place, you know. It said New York, it's, it, maybe that's a little bit different, but it's just, you know, taking one thing, taking 
I don't think they used the same script, or maybe they just took the same script and kind of changed it up, made things a little bit different, but it just, it feels like they just mixed things up just a little bit and threw it back out there. Like, they put everything in the first film in a box, shuffled up, threw it in, and just came out a different direction. And Bangkok this time, it's not, it's not the groom, Stu, it's the bride's Right to be his uh, little brother. So, man. Let's talk about the characters first before I get into the major plot stuff. Phil. Nothing changed from Phil. Nothing has changed from these characters. I mean, you you feel like at the end of the first film, they've all come together. They're friends. But the beginning of this film, Stu is back to being erotic. Like, at the end of the last film, he stood up to, to Melissa. He became his own man, and he... Change for the good. Now he's back to being neurotic. He's afraid of everything again. And he doesn't want it to be anywhere near Alan. Phil, still a dick. Even though he learned to appreciate his family in the last one, no, nope, still a dick. You know? And then there's Alan. Who's probably gotten worse than before. He he is He's an asshole, is what he is. He treats his parents like slaves. He's he's just a dick to Teddy just because he thinks that Teddy's gonna come in and take over the wolf pack a spot away from him. It just I don't know. It they're playing off like like Alan is jealous. And that ends up leading to what happens. Uh but uh you know Stu doesn't even want to have a bachelor brunch. Now let's talk about Lauren. No offense to Jamie Chung. But. She gets as much to do in this movie. As Tracy does in the last one. And this one to be honest. And. Again. It feels like. They just. Switch things around. So now Stu. Is the groom. And he's getting married. And so that's changed. But. With, by doing that, they didn't make... They had to have someone of Asian descent to be the... I keep hitting that. To be his wife so they can go to Bangkok. Otherwise, it does... Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. But it doesn't make sense that it's not Heather Graham from the first film. That he said they was going to go back and they were going to start dating each other. And then... They don't do that because they just took whatever script and jumbled it up a little bit. Just that's what it seems like. And so because of that, when we get to the third one, they make us some excuses to why it didn't happen. <clears throat> but it feels like it should have. But didn't. And now you have Lauren. Like I said, Jamie Chung, she's fine. But I think the biggest and, and this goes for all three films. The biggest missed opportunity is Doug. Okay, Doug gets shat on in all three of these films, basically. In the first film, he disappears. He's up on a roof for the entire film. And he's horribly sunburned when they find him. This film, he's sidelined the entire movie. Why? Because they didn't have anything for him. Because they just reused the same script. They just reused the same script. So he had to be sidelined somehow. So he just, instead of him joining them, he just stays at the resort and answers phone calls a couple times during the movie. And then the next one, spoiler alert, he just gets kidnapped by the villain of the film. And then, you know, and then they, they include Chow back in this. But, it feels like you could have taken Chow out and he wasn't, like he wasn't needed. And that means, like they, first of all, they shoehorn him in here by having to say that he and Alan have been hanging out on the side after the events of the first film, which makes no sense. But also, he shows up after they have blacked out and wake up again, and he's there. And they have him get ready to tell them exactly what happened the night before, but he does a line of coke, and then his heart stops. Apparently, that's how cocaine works. You can do a line of coke... Your heart stops, and you wake up an hour later just fine. I don't think that's how it works, 
But yeah, he does it, and he's dead. They put him in the ice box, and then later they had to go back and get him because Paul Giamatti shows up, saying that he's the one selling stuff to uh, to Chow Kingsley. Plays Kingsley. It turns out he's a cop, and they never had Teddy because like everything. It's even worse than this one. Everything they, they keep pushing. Like, they follow these like they did in the last one. But there's a couple times. Like, they're about to learn from Chow what happened. He, a heart, his heart stops. He, you know, his heart stops. He dies. And they put him in an ice machine. So they don't know what happened now. So then they have to go and have to piece things together. But, and the only reason why Chow is there. So that they can come back and get him later. For when they need him. There, which, you know, you take that out, and you could just have Alan know that Chow is set up somewhere in Bangkok. Oh, we've been emailing back and forth. He has a little setup here in Bangkok. And then, again, with with the monkey. They have the monkey with them. Some dudes attack them and take the monkey back. But then later, they need the monkey... To get the passcodes, the child's passcodes, so they have to go get the monkey again. It's just, it's redundant. It's it's revisiting things. Like, they could have just been told by child what happened. No, he had to have a heart attack and die. But he's not dead, because I gotta go back and get him. He's not dead. And then they had the monkey. They lost the monkey. They will get the monkey again. It's like, it's prolonging stuff, just for the sake of padding on runtime. Right? And also, there is several things where it's like, oh, Teddy, we found Teddy. No, it's a monk who can't talk because he took a vow of silence. You got to take it to the place. Maybe they'll figure out what's going on. No, everyone there is taking a vow of silence, except for a couple of them, I guess. And you say they get beat the crap out of. And that wastes a little bit of time. And then you have that Alan have a weird spiritual moment where he finds out what happened. And so where do we go? A strip club. A trans strip club with trans women, men, trans women still have winners, basically. So we can have the mental image of Stu being fucked in the ass by a trans woman and finishing up on the floor. They literally say that because that's the mental image you want to have inside your head. Yeah. I mean, love to a man. A man with boobies. Okay, that is a funny line. There, There is some funny... There, I do laugh. There is some funny stuff with Alan. You know, he's overall responsible for everything, and he's paying the ass. There's a, there's a point where they're at the recept, where, when they're at the rehearsal dinner, and Teddy plays his little song, and they look at, at, look at Alan, and he goes... Because he, he doesn't like Teddy. Yes, and then we find out, despite the fact that Alan said earlier, it wasn't me this time, I swear to God. It felt like they were trying to figure out another way for this to happen. And so they had that part when they wrote the first part of the script. And they're like, okay, there's no other way to do it than to have it be Alan. So he drugged the marshmallows this time. With some muscle relaxers and ADHD medication. I don't think that makes you pass out, but fine. Whatever. It's a movie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way. Stu has the Mike Tyson tattoo. And the only reason it's on there is so at the end of the movie, they can have a punchline where Mike Tyson is... Stu's wedding gift, and he sings one night in Bangkok, and then yells at him to get rid of the tattoo. That's it. That is it. That's the only reason why that's in there. It plays no other part in the film other than they go to the tattoo place to talk to the guy in charge, who happens to be American, American and speak English, because, of course. I don't know. Is this left a... Sour taste in my mouth overall. I feel like they could have done more. Could have done better with this. And where was Teddy? Well, it's as simple as the last one. 
He was in the elevator the entire time, but because Bangkok just has random power outages, apparently, and he's been stuck in the elevator all day, even though we saw the power was just on when Alan was playing Pac-Man. But Teddy was still... Now, I get why Doug was out of it. He was on a roof the entire time. He's losing it, stuff like that. He's sunburned, whatever. But Teddy has been in an elevator all day. He would be more awake than he was. And then we, they have the wedding, and it's basically the same thing. And Stu stands up to his new father-in-law, and they have the wedding. And Mike Tyson is there, like I said, and yeah. And I do like Brian Callen's character in this, Samir. I like him better than this one in the first one. You spit to me? You spit to me? You know? You spit to me? You spit to me? I love, I love him. Just, yeah. But, at the end of the day, I don't know. It's just the same shit recycled over and over again. It's one, you know, if you're going to do a sequel, do something new. You know? It might as well just be a remake. Of the hangover in Bangkok. It's basically what it is. But with the same characters. You know. Uh, but yeah. I'm going to give it a middle of the road. Because I feel like they could have done better. And I'm going to have to rewatch the third one. Which is the next review I'm going to do actually. To see for sure. If this one is better. I think it, I think I remember it being better. It's because they do something different. They try to tie it up because they said that this is going to be the last one so they try to make it come full circle and really if i remember correctly this should have just been the second one and it would have worked better i think but uh anyway what are your thoughts on the hangover part two let me know comments let me make sure you like share and subscribe thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next one